Curator and Research Center Manager here at the uh, Writers and Image Center. Um, I'm also the organizer of the Noontime Collection uh, Talk Series, of which this is our final talk in the academic year. So thank you all for attending, and I hope that you will um, keep your eyes open for the announcements of our next season of talks, which will start in September 2018, um, with a new lineup um, of talks uh, here in this space that will look at works in our collection from uh, the perspectives of different experts in the field. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, I'm really excited to introduce to you today's speaker, um, Zoe Lepiano, who has been a longtime friend of the RIC um, in many ways. Um, Zoe has a BFA in photography from Concordia University and an MA from Ryerson's Film and Photography Preservation and Collections Management Program. She was born and raised in Toronto, but has lived in Montreal, Berlin, and London, England, and most recently Bermuda, where she worked with the collection of the Masterworks Museum of Bermuda Art. Her research interests have focused on photography at the turn of the 20th century and representations of the self. She completed her thesis on the well-known family series by photographer Sally Mann, with whom she completed an internship in 2015. Since graduating from Ryerson, Zoe has worked as a researcher, archivist, and guest curator. In 2017, she returned to the RIC as the Howard Tannenbaum Research Fellow, during which time she focused on the, on the Wendy Snyder McNeil Archive, um, which came to the RIC beginning in 2005, uh, of course through the diligence of IMA Professor um, Don Snyder, working closely with Peter Higdon, who are here with us today. So today, Zoe is going to be talking to us about some works, um, specifically from Wendy Snyder McNeil's series, biographies, and album pages. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming Zoe. Um, before I start, I just want to say thank you to the staff of the Ryerson Image Center and the Peter Higgins Research Center. Um, thank you to Denise for inviting me in to speak uh, as part of this series, and um, to Anna, who I've been working with uh, in various forms uh, since 2015 on the Wendy Snyder McNeil Archive, to Charlene, who um, was very supportive of my research during my fellowship last year. Um, both on-site and off-site over drinks, <laughs> um, where many of the sort of early seeds of this talk were first sown. Um, of course, to Don Snyder, who has from the beginning um, been very encouraging about my research and has uh, provided um, access to his expertise throughout. Um, and of course, also to uh, Ronald McNeil, Wendy's husband, who is not here because he lives in Lincoln, Massachusetts, but he was also very much um, an important part in, in my fellowship last year. So, and thank you to all of you for being here during your lunch hours uh, to what is this, I, I guess, the last talk of the season. I will start first by introducing Wendy Snyder McNeil. Um, so for those of you who do not know her, Wendy Snyder, later Snyder McNeil, um, was born in 1943 in Boston. She's a photographer, filmmaker, and um, teacher. So Wendy, I'm going to make sure I don't lose any of the important parts. So I want to actually start from a quote that she has in one of this book here. Thank you. Which I think says a little bit not only about her and her photography, but also is very much so um, specifically directed towards the series that I'm going to be talking about today. So I have no choice but to make portraits. They are my life. So Wendy's early work in the 1960s focused on black and white straight photography, sort of people, portraits of people within their environment. Between 1968 and 1970, she worked on a series called Haymarket, the book of which is there. Um, and it was, it's an award-winning book. Um, it combines straight photographs, black and white film prints um, of, of Boston's now extinct Haymarket with interviews and quotes uh, from the workers uh, at Haymarket. In 1968, after ha she finished working on Haymarket, she at the same time got a position teaching at Ab Abbott Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. She then went on also to teach at Wellesley, Academy and then at uh, RISD 
College of Art. She was a part-time teacher there until 2007. So her teaching uh, career and her photography career as well as her filmmaking career are very much so intertwined. Wendy switched from dealing with sort of environmental portraiture around 1968 and started to focus on looking at those closest to her. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. It's the switch is very much so apparent in the series, which began as biographies and then became album pages. The series took place over about 12 years, and the work that you see here that I've pulled is from both series. So it's a combination of, of both of those series. So the, the album pages are sort of the final exhibition print album pages, which are on white boxes. There's two of them here. For those of you who weren't able to see before the talk, you'll be able to get a chance to, to look at them after. Um, and then I also have brought in some of the earlier works from 1968, 1970, 1972, 73, which are more of the gelatin silver prints. I'm going to talk about them as one series, even though they began as two individual uh, things. So before I go on, I would also just note my relationship within the archive. So first time I saw Wendy Snyder McNeil's album pages was with Don Snyder, 2014, sorry, when I was in his collections class for the uh, Film and Photography Preservation and Collections Management Program that I was in here at Ryerson. And we came up to the Ryerson Inter Center, uh, sorry, the Peter Higdon Research Center, and we were looking at many different photographs within the collection, and uh, two or three of the photographs he brought out were the album pages. And I remember this because I studied, I did BFA in, at Concordia, and my final uh, thesis project at that time had been creating albumin prints of, so 19th century, using a 19th century pro process to render portraits of family and friends in my life. So when I saw the, al the album pages, I thought, I know exactly what she's doing. And uh, it just really resonate, resonated with me, but I also felt suddenly uh, that, that, I, that she had resolved something for me as well that I had not been able to resolve in that project. And, I, I became very interested in the series and in, and in her practice. So in 2015, I began working at the Ryerson Image Center as uh, a collection cataloging assistant with Anna, who um, at the time was sort of re-looking at the organization of this archive, because as Denise mentioned, it came in in 2005, 2007, I guess is the beginning. And then really the first three installments happened until 2009. But uh, again, in 2015, more work came in. And even last year during my fellowship, the final sort of uh, audio cassettes of, 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 the, of the collection came in. So it's been, almost, it's been a, a 10 year period really of, of acquiring this work. And because of that, of course, many hands have taken part in its organization. Um, so in 2015, it was also an important time um, to be looking at this work because of the retrospective that was in the works, which happened in 2016. I hope some of you, I'm sure some of you may have seen it. So um, Wendy Snyder McNeil, The Light Inside, and there is, of course, the catalog of that exhibition on the table. So if you'd like to look through that and pass it around, please feel free. Um, so during this time, we were really looking at the entirety of the work, so the whole archive. And as we were going through, you know, the sort of um, process of cataloging and figuring out what was there and how to organize it, um, I started to see the, that there was a sort of unresolved section to the archive, if I can call it that. So I was, I was finding these, we were finding, Anna and I were finding these um, sort of packets of uh, sections of prints, work prints, contact sheets, um, cutouts, mock-ups, sort of works in process that were very much so um, connected to biographies. I could, uh, by, by a final sort of, by the, to the final, to these, which I'm, which I'm referring to as biographies, to final gelatin silver exhibition prints that she also had in the collection. Um, they were connected to them because of the people in the images, but they seemed to me to be 
um, evidence of something that was happening for her in her process at the time. This was made further evident by the fact that I found a number of transcripts in the collection, in the archive um, that were connected to the people that she was photographing, but that seemed to also remain sort of unresolved. Um, I also at that time started to see connections between her earlier work, so Haymarket, and then the work she had done before that, which, which was with Irish tinkers as well as um, a, a, a church and also a series of, of uh, photographs of um, children who were in uh, a school for children with uh, special needs. So I was starting to see a connection between not only the, those people she was photographing, but the way that she was photographing and then also the shift to um, away from the singular portrait, if I can say that. So away from the, the sort of straight photographic portrait, which you can see here um, and at the front there. So this, I was really, I became really interested in this moment of transition from her kind of straight documentary portraits to a more composite way of making uh, portraits. So with that, I uh, am going to turn to the to the material that's here now. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to be looking at the album pages and biographies as a way to talk about her use of portraiture and the way that she was using it both to address identity and also to, kind of to complicate it. Biographies, as I mentioned, began in 1968. In 1976, she had stopped calling it biographies, 1977 I should say, and she began to call this project album pages. So what happened in between that time? And I was really interested in that. I'm going to look at that, look at what happened by looking at the material here and also by looking at who it was that she was photographed. I'm actually going to start here with this uh, selection of images, which is of Wendy's grandmother, who she calls Gogs, um, whose full name is um, Virginia Townsend Ferry. So she was born in 1892 and died in 1989. Um, before I talk about the photographs, I just want to mention um, an excerpt that I found within the archive that addresses the audio transcripts that I also found, um, and that really played a big part on sort of planting the seed for my fellowship. This is in, this is written by Wendy and I'm just gonna read it. So this accompanied a CD that I found alongside the transcripts. So the Voices CD is essentially my own playlist. Voices I could listen to again and again rather than see, um, or even, uh, rather than seeing an even-handed sample of everyone I recorded. Rather, sorry, rather than being an even-handed sample of everyone I recorded. This sort of opened up to me the fact that she had started this project in very much a similar way that she had started Haymarket, as in that she was using straight photography to photograph, to make portraits of those people in her life in, a, in various environments. She was also collecting audio recordings of them at that same time. However, as it says in the note, she was unable to resolve this. So she goes on to say, I knew nothing about recording sound. It could barely find the on and off buttons. But now, of course, 40 years later, I wish I'd taken the time to at least learn the rudiments because I'm much more interested in the sound of the voices than I am in their transcriptions on the page. So it be, I began to see, again, this kind of evidence of something that had started um, and had been unresolved and then had finalized in a very, had been finalized in a very different form of the album pages. I'm gonna play for you um, some of this audio because I think, first of all, it just introduces Wendy's grandmother in a way that I cannot um, and because, because we have it, so why not? Okay, so this is Wendy's um, grandmother Virginia Townsend speaking to Wendy in 1970 at the very beginning of this project. I did not start life alone. There were two of us, my twin brother and myself. 
on April 27, 1892. My little brother was so thin and emaciated that the doctors said he could not live. And my mother, who had a very strong will, said he will live, and he did live, but to grow up to be a very different person from his sister in every way, except that we were a family of six, and we were the only ones that were passionately fond of music. He played the violin, and I played the piano, and we never could play together because we interpreted music so differently. I had four brothers. My twin was the one that I was least like. He was very temperamental, he was very nervous. I was a naughty little girl in many ways because I had four brothers to lead me astray. One day, I thought we had a little balcony outside our house and I thought it was very funny to fill it full of water, fill a bag full of water and drop it down just in front of the people who were walking. Not to hit them, but we just hit in front of them. And I thought that was a great... You hit them once in a while. No, that was a great joke. I never wanted to hurt anybody. And Are you sure? I was mischievous. And I was full of fun. When I married, I became more serious because I married a very serious man who once said to me, you cannot be too serious. You were fairly serious at the time I married you. I want to do that. You weren't just a friend of each other. No, but I was, I was uh, gay, much gayer. And then life closed in on me. Again, just a reminder that those are the snippets that Wendy herself was most attached to. So actually within the archive there are the original uh, audio cassettes that are, of course, many more hours of tape. But I think what's so fascinating about what she picked is that it, it does connect back to the photographs um, and to this interest in trying to document the entirety of, of a person's life. So all of their, how, do, how does one portrait or how does a portrait Act, um, represent the entirety of somebody's life and all of the different roles and relationships that have occurred throughout. And looking here at Wendy's grandmother, you can see evidence of her trying to work through that that um, problem, the problem with of representation. Um, so she's she's doing this here by here. We have images of vernacular photographs. So we have a photograph of Wendy, Wendy's grandmother, Gods, Virginia, with her five siblings, who she mentions in the audio tape, and of course their mother. Then we have um, more photographs of, of I assume, the, this, the relationship between Gods and her mother, as well as sort of different moments throughout her life, people in her life. Then later here we have her with her husband, Ronald, um, and of course, color images of, of the two of them together later in life. You also heard him speak um, on, on the audio tape. So what's interesting is that a lot of these photographs are not the original. So she's obviously asked her grandmother, I assume, for um, images from her life. So these are snapshot vernacular images, album, images from from photo albums, right? That would have already probably been part of the family history. And she's taking them um, into the studio and re-photographing them and making copy prints and then printing them and cutting them out um, to try to figure out a way to tie the vernacular, the snapshot um, to her portraits uh, that she was making of her grandmother. And so there is real evidence of this here um, in in these in these sort of bits that I've laid out, which which all came together under the the heading Gogs or grandmother. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll lift this one up later on. We also see in the the contact sheets that she's cut out and obviously then with tape stuck up. So she's thinking about um, how these fit into how these might fit together. So we have an image of her and her her husband again. So sort of her as a, as a wife, and then I, I assume her in, in her home 
um, and I'm not sure, but I, I imagine this may have been then taken, these, if some of these images were then taken later in 1973, and Don, you might be able to speak about this, but I assume this is um, then after the passing of her husband. So she is, um, again, sort of a woman, uh, well, she's, a, she's an older woman in, in mourning, but also then for the first time in, in many decades, her own sort of individual singular being uh, in the world as, a, as, a, as an older female. So that is also then represented in the way that Wendy was photographing her, and she's sort of trying to resolve these different roles and um, versions of her grandmother. The, the part that she didn't know and couldn't have known because it had happened before her, and then the part, and then who she also is in the present. So one of the things um, that I would just like to mention about biographies is that, uh, so Wendy went through a couple of stages with them, and although I don't have a good example of that uh, here from Gogs, I have it from, from the two other groupings of people, which I'll talk about later, but she she went she began really with the straight photographs so sort of the right sort of black and white portrait um, and then through this process and I really see this happening for the first time with her grandmother she starts to f try to think about how to combine vernacular images from the photo album with her own portraiture and you can see that here and this image which is of her grandmother on her 83rd birthday um, is accompanied by her grandmother being held by her mother, um, which Wendy has printed and sort of made, uh, put together so that they are on the same page. So this is no longer in the photo album, but it becomes part of the poor own Wendy's own portrait of her grandmother. Um, and to me, this is really the, the beginning of what would later become album page. So you can see the beginnings of this as well in her work prints. Here there is um, an image of her, of Virginia, Wendy's grandmother, and her, I, her husband Ronald as when they were both young, beside an image of her grandmother with a veil after the passing of, of, of her husband. Um, you see four images here, also from all different stages of her life. So Wendy's grandmother, in this, just in this selection that I've made from the archive, is represented um, as a child, as a daughter, as a sister. She's also um, a wife. She's also a mother. Um, and then, of course, at the end of her life, she is uh, sort of negotiating what that means to be an older, an older woman. Um, having lived all of these different roles. I am just gonna mention that you might notice there seems to be some, some uh, similarities between some of the, these images here. The images that I'm, I'm referring to are the ones that have sort of a white square where the photographs have been mounted on them directly. I started to see these as being connected because they were all cut to, to be the same size. Um, and I, I was actually able to ask Wendy this in 2016, um, and she did tell me that the biographies, so this would have been the straight photographs as well as the early beginnings of her mixing her own portraits with some of the album, some of the vernacular images she was collecting from her sitters, as well as the audio transcripts, she was collecting these and making them into a book. Um, so this would have been the evidence of that first book. Uh, she got a Guggenheim grant for this series and then two an, um, National Endowment of the Arts awards for this series, um, but the later National Endowment of the Arts award was actually for a way, was given to her as a way to figure out how to resolve the series after um, she decided to move away from the book form and try to figure out a way to uh, resolve the, the series in a different way. Wendy told me that actually what had happened is she had, the book had been rejected from the publisher because they were not interested uh, in 
what they what they thought to be as something that was much too personal. So you have to remember this is uh, you know early 1970s. So it's a really interesting time in photography where you know 1977 we have Cindy Sherman's film stills. So you think about like when she was working, you know the. The fine art print, the black and white fine art print was still being championed. It was a very male dominated world. There was this, all this sort of stuff that was shifting, but um, still the book at that time for the publisher would have seemed to, to be too, um, too much connected to the personal. Um, so she, she shifted at that point and, and started to think about it in different ways. But that's why these are, are here and seem connected to each other. So. Moving on from Gags, uh, who was never fully resolved the, as an album page. Um, interestingly enough, although Wendy, um, in the archive, Wendy, you see evidence that Wendy had photographed her for actually maybe the longest period of time. So for the entire 10 years that she was working um, on this project, uh, Gags is, is there. I will say that one of the final way that she does sort of resolve her interest in, in sort of representing her grandmother is by use of her hand. So there's an image of, of her hand here, taken in 1977. This photograph um, appears later in a series called Hands, which she begins in 1983. So again, this sort of connection of the process and the way she's working. Talk a little bit about the hands now as we're here. So this this image is an image, a poster that um, where you can see actually her use of the word biographies. This is from 1977. So it's hard to yeah. It's also one of the first platinum palladium prints. Um, so we start to see her using a different process here. She's moving away from gelatin silver into platinum palladium, which for those of you who don't know, it's essentially she's making her own emulsion and rolling it on this piece of paper. Um, so she, this was uh, the sort of beginning of that. She hadn't yet moved to vellum. So the final al al album pages are on vellum. So it's platinum palladium on vellum, but here we're seeing it on um, BFK Reeves paper. So <coughs> these two hands are not her grandmother's hands. They are actually her husband and her husband's father's hands. But again, this relationship between father, son, between family members is very much so present here. So I'm going to move on to Aunt Harriet, who is here and again um, an important important part of the series. It links Gogs because it is Gogs' older sister and only sister, um, but it also talks about this shift. Um, it's I think it's very evident here, the shift from, um, there's less, there's le there's very few portraits of her Aunt Harriet as in sort of straight form. He, by now, she's very much so interested in this mixing of the album, the sort of photographic album, vernacular snapshot images with with the, with the images that she's taking. So you can see that here again from one of the book maquettes. So this is uh, Harriet Townsend Bottomley, old, older sister of Virginia Townsend Ferry, and here's an image again that that image of. Um, Gogs and, and, and Harriet's mother holding her five children. And then beside it, we have what I assume to be um, Aunt, Harriet's, Aunt Harriet and her three daughters. So again, this relationship between um, her, her aunt, her great aunt as a child and then as a mother herself. We can see that again here in what is called the study for Aunt Harriet and her mother. So, I don't know if I can hold that. You don't think, oh, that's fair. Okay, you'll have to look at it afterwards. But right in the in the middle, there's an image that says mother, and then beside it we have, have Aunt Harriet, and then beside it we have her mother, and beside that to the left we have Aunt Harriet, and then Aunt Harriet and her mother. So, here, 
what I think is interesting is she's really, she's shifting from looking at sort of the individual's story and her, um, how to represent the individual and moving towards relationships. So the connection between family members um, is very apparent here. She's, how does Harriet's mother visually connect to Harriet? And does she? And what does that? What does that mean? What is that? How do, how do you represent that on the page? Um, I, I'm going to quickly just play you something because I think um, it will help. I was told not to eat any of those red berries. They would kill me. We were out walking with a baby, and I was curious about death. So when she wasn't looking, I picked some of those red berries and fed them to the baby. Watch to see him die. So that is the quote that I have up here. Um, so she, you can also see here how she's using the audio recordings. She's thinking about them and trying to figure out how they might work together with the, with the portraits and also with the, with the snapshots that she's collected. Um, again, and Harriet does not have a resolved album page. So one of another reason why I found um, this really fascinating. Like how how did she just the way she was thinking about about the relationship between the individual, the family, um, and the album, and the portrait, the singular portrait, how how do you how do you make those how do you elucidate that in one single image? How do you flatten that and make um, it apparent um, using, using photography? So I am going to now move on to Marie Barrette because Marie Barrette in a way is the most resolved of all of the people who I've pulled out to talk about. So Marie Barrette is a French teacher. She was a French teacher at Abbott Academy where Wendy also taught. So she was a, a teacher there from the 1940s until retirement. She lived um, in Andover until her death. But she emigrated from France after the German occupation. Um, and Marie returned to France yearly. So she also had a very close relationship with Wendy. Wendy, who also spoke French. And their friendship lasted into Marie's retirement from Abbott. She photographed, Wendy photographed Marie for almost a decade, from 1972 until 1981. I have the transcripts here as an example of what these transcripts look like, um, and I'm now going to play the audio from that uh, transcript that Wendy Wendy edited down on the CD because I I think it, because it talks about another area that I'm interested in, which is the different types of people she was photographing. So. This is France was easy to take, nothing to it. Now we're going to rest for a little while, then we'll go over to England. I said, no, you will not. He said, oh, yes, we will. I said, no, you won't. <laughs> he looked at me, sort of surprised, and said, well, and then we'll take some rest and go over to America. I said, that's out of the question. You never will. They were always trying to know what we thought. And uh, I remember one morning I was... Uh, I was ready to go to church, and one of them stopped me and said, Vous allez au culte? I said, yes. What does that mean? You are going to the service. I said, oui, yes. And he said, you hate us, don't you? I said, oh no, I feel sorry for you. And every time there was a bombing, they would come up and say, boom, 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 bah, 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 We would say, no, we won't. We won't go down with you. But, but, but. We won't go down, said Mother. You go if you want to, but we won't die with you. And uh, an officer was very... He would just say... Mother said, we are not going to move because the government told us to stay and we are going to stay. And he said, oh, but the government, that's us. So Mother said, oh, no, not yet. One egg a month with a coupon, <laughs> we would have starved to death. But some of the farmers were very nice to us. They, in fact, they were very good to us because they were the ones uh, we depended on to live. They were the ones who had the meat, the eggs, the butter, the milk and the butter. We were not supposed to have milk, we are not old enough. 
So when I came, I came here after the war, I was so, I just couldn't believe what I saw. It was too much for me, luxury here. The waste, the waste broke my heart. And I had been without so many things for so long that I couldn't even accept a glass of milk. I, I used to refuse to drink it. And I was scared to death, I didn't want to talk. Well, you see, during the war, we were not supposed to talk because everybody could have repeated anything to anybody. We were, we were used to saying very, very little. And here, I didn't talk either. So, you, as you um, can guess, that, that was Marie Barrette speaking about her experience as a young girl during the occupation of France by Germany. So, um, and I think Marie Barrette also, so this is a move away from, from Wendy photographing her family, and she's, she's uh, Marie is still very close to Wendy in her life, but um, Wendy, Wendy treats Marie a little bit differently. So we have Marie Barrette um, in relationship to her career. So we have Marie Barrette here. Um, Wendy starts collecting sort of ephemera from Marie Barrette's time at Abbott as well as his time as a French teacher. So we have Marie Barrette, images of Marie beside her um, business card, basically. Um, we also have then Marie as a young girl, um, I assume, in France. Um, we have Marie in front of a map. Again, I assume this is a map um, of France, the territory of France that she, she was originally from. Here we have Marie um, pointing to a medal that she wins, um, which the, there is also a newspaper clipping that Wendy has saved talking about, uh, that, that sort of talks about this honor that she's been awarded, Marie Barrette's been awarded. Um, we have a contact print from Marie teaching in the classroom, so this is her, in her environment, teaching. Um, and then Here on the up here on the rail, we have um, an image that appears in a number of the. Again, there's a, there's an image of it there in that location. It appears in a number of locations here, where in her early um, sort of exploration of the beginning of biography. So Marie Barrette, this is of course her uh, drinking tea. It's a very strong image. Um, she feels there's it's interesting it's always been interesting to me this image because the teacup makes her there's something about there's a fragility to it but then she's so stoic and she's so strong and listening to that audio of her and the and and knowing that that was the part of the audio tape that Wendy found to be the most significant it there's a connection for me between these those two things this image and that audio so perfect Okay, so I'm just going to go over, finish this up. So you can see here that we have, again, a sort of early work print where she starts carrying that image with an image of Marie as a younger person. This is from 1949. And then here where she's actually, Marie is actually looking at herself and looking at those two images. Um, I also have put out some color, color snapshots of Marie's uh, home in France that she went back to yearly, and that Wendy actually went and visited um, her her place at some point. She went she went with Marie back to France and took this photograph. So it it comes to it is resolved in this final album page, which was made between 1978 and 1981, which is platinum, palladium, on vellum, um, and is a sort of institutional photo ID card photograph of, of Marie Barrette. There is the a passport image of her, and then at the bottom there are images from all different points in her life. So her as a young girl in France, um, and then the two last ones are the images that Marie herself, sorry, Wendy herself has taken. So I 
wanted to just say that the interesting thing for me for the Platinum Palladium and what I think Wendy does so successfully at the end, when she's when she, by combining all of these together in the by using the platinum plating on the vellum, is that she's essentially flattening all of these different types of photography, which at that point, and you know still would have had different hierarchical relationships. So an ID card image on from a from an ID an image from an ID card and this portrait that Wendy took are very different types of photography, right? And yet, by flattening them, by flattening the, by flattening the, the sort of, those references, by using the platinum palladium medium and the vellum, she's essentially democratizing all of these representations of her sitters. So all of the be them become as, become equal. And in doing that, to me, she, is addressing this issue of representation that was uh, so important at the time was becoming was was becoming so discussed at the time, which was, of course, the issue of the singular image and you know the issue of the gaze and how does one actually represent a person who you know the autonomy of the sitter versus the person the photographer themselves. So all of these sorts of things um, come into play in this final final uh, final iteration of the project, the album pages. I just wanted, before I open it up, I just also want to say, I'm going to move all the way down to the beginning, that interestingly enough, although she's able to resolve Marie Brett in, in the album page, the a, lar a large sort of number of the final album pages are actually of those people in her community that um, were a little bit less connected to her. I, I don't know if I can say that, to say that, but um, in, they are not necessarily family. So we have Tanu uh, and Endel Callum, who she photographed, again, straight photograph, and then here on the album page we have um, Tanu, who is the father, and Endel, who is, sorry, Endel, who's the father, Tanu, who's the son, um, who, again, are being compared sort of together, and their relationship is being looked at by that flattening. Um, Wendy, when I was looking at this, I realized was, was really interested in three sort of major groups. She was focused on um, family, mentors, um, artists, and emigres. And so, and those groups are fluid, obviously. So I would say that Gags is both a family as well as a mentor. Um, Marie, Marie Barrett is a mentor. She's also, um, and Emma Gray, and then uh, Tanu and Endel, both musicians um, and artists, uh, well, musicians, and would have been probably mentors, but also would have been members of the community. So I am just gonna finish and open this up to say that um, Wendy seems to have had a very expansive understanding of history. So her awareness and interest of, of for me, specifically in what I pull here, of a previous generation of, of women, um, those also who lived alternative lifestyles, and those who experienced great hardships. Um, her ability to recognize the significance of those stories and histories, while at the same time um, teaching photography, seeing the medium as a method to capture, record, and collect. Um, she was also aware of how the medium had been used and could be used, was pushing to see how far it could be used. Um, I also start, because of that, sort of start to see these, this project as self-portraiture. So I can see Wendy sort of trying to test out also her own relationships and her own roles. So at the time she's, she is in, 19, in the early 1980s, she becomes a mother, and so also her role as an artist, her role as a mentor, her role as a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister. These, this project also, in a way, can, to me, become, become sort of a form of, of self-portraiture. So I'm gonna open this up to questions, and, and my, um, one of the things I've been thinking about is 
this project in relation to other projects. So in particular, the Joe Spence archive that we have here, we know that Joe Spence, one of her most famous bodies of work was, be called, was is called Beyond the Album, and it, and sh it was shown in the Hayward Gallery in 1979. So this is at a time when um, photography and what photography, art photography was supposed to be was really being blown open. And I, and I guess I'm just gonna open it up and we can talk a little bit about that and think a little bit more about where this work falls within that larger history um, and also what it means that some of it was unresolved and the way that it ended up being resolved and, and just sort of that 